My name is Hunter Gilroy. I'm the president of the Computer Science Technology Club here at NIC. We are hosting this event, we put it together. And um, if you want to know more about that, let me know after the meeting or after the event. But without further ado, I present Jason McDonald with his speech, Field Guys and Common Nurse. message that pops up on my Linux machine as I'm trying to build a program. Sanity tests are a really important concept in computer science. They allow us to determine if there's any major mathematical or logical errors that could break the computer. Unfortunately, we don't run any of those sanity tests on our mouse before we talk in the computer science industry, it seems. In that sense, the build environment is completely insane. And I wish someone had told me, an 18-year-old programmer who was ready to start building in Python, when I wandered into a chat room for programmers and got totally shredded. There's a lot of weird personalities in the world of programming. And social skills don't necessarily apply in the way we expect them to. Today I want to share with you some of these strange people you're going to find in the world of computer science. Three habits you need to break to survive as a programmer, and how to maintain a connection to the real world of the process. See, the hard skills, how to program, how to build stuff in different languages and on different computers, that's only half the picture. The other half is the soft skills, those social skills I've been mentioning. I learned these the hard way, and I don't recommend it because it's not fun. The best time to start building these skills is now, whether you're brand new to the field or been doing it for a while. Now, as for myself, I'm the CEO and lead developer of Mousepaw Games. I have self-taught multiple languages and um, also a student of Nancy Ricklinger. But I'm not the only one who has made these observations about the computer science world. Scott Rosenberg, author of Dreaming in Code, Eric S. Raymond, the author of the New Hacker's Dictionary, which is a very funny read, by the way. And Jeff Atwood, a, an acclaimed programmer, blogger, and the founder of Stack Overflow, one of the better known programming communities online, have all made similar observations. Bit of a disclaimer, there's no joke I'm about to make that I wouldn't repeat to the professionals I work with. See, it's really hard for greenhorns who get respected or heard in this field, and that's true whether you have a degree in computer science or not, that's because a lot of programmers really dislike newbies. I figured out really quickly the easiest way to survive was to hide my inexperience. As I said, I've been cataloging a lot of these personalities, and I'm not the first. Eric S. Raymond said that programmers are generally not like other people. They tend towards self-absorption, intellectual arrogance, and um, Impatience with people and tasks perceived to be a waste of their time. First species I want to discuss is the Programmaticus nubiflamerus. This species uh, will tear down their victims, intelligence, um, professional status, projects, viability, personality, etc. They'll basically attack over any statement they deem to be newbie obvious or incorrect in nature. And they generally do it while all very carefully avoiding giving any semblance of an actual answer. This species is quite irritating to encounter, but the first thing to do when you run into one is to lay as still as possible. In a word, <laughs> keep your mouth shut. This earns you experience uh, points in the world of programming because you have enough wisdom not to attack back. And by the way, this species really enjoys getting into arguments, so don't feed the troll. They will attack... Um, the attack will often attract more beneficial species of programmers that are capable of fending off the programmaticus and newbie flamerous. One thing to be aware of, however, is that many attacks by this species are somewhat brought on by the person asking the question, albeit completely unknown to them. So avoid looking like this species, number one, prey. Programmaticus, no Googleus. <laughs> this species 
ask questions with the whole point of avoiding research or actually writing any code at all. They're considered lazy, lazy and parasitic. They won't look things up, ergo, no Googleists. And they really are not interested in writing any code themselves. I call this Swedish chef programming, if you're familiar with the Muppets. You find a bunch of code from around the internet, throw it into the machine, press the compile button, and fork, fork, fork. It doesn't work, and then they come to us trying to find out why. So how do you avoid looking like this species? Well, first of all, read the documentation, often abbreviated RTD or RTFD, as the case may be. Each programming language has a very large resource of information in its documentation, and it's the first place you want to look when you want to ask a question. Chances are, it's already been answered by the people that wrote the language. Let me Google that for you. Early new phrase, meaning seriously, you couldn't look that up yourself. Uh, there's actually a website dedicated to this, by the way. You should spend at least 15 minutes doing some research on the programming problem you're facing before asking a question. Generally, programmers hate give me decodes type questions. So you need to <coughs> experiment, try things out, and then tell us what have you tried. This is according to programmer and blogger Matt Gimmel. Now, don't confuse the give me the codes mentality with the good practice of rewriting and reusing code. There's an adage in the computer science industry. Good programmers know what to write. Great programmers know what to rewrite and reuse. Now, you may be thinking right about now that uh, this field is terribly brutal, it's elitist, it's cruel. And you're right. It's not fun getting started. But we have the opportunity, opportunity to change that because it's the greenhorn of today that is the expert of tomorrow. We get to set the environment of the next several years. Now, thankfully, programmaticus can be flamers, programmaticus no Googleists. They're the exception, not the rule. The species you want to find, and hopefully eventually become, is programmaticus mentorius. This species is a very gentle, they will do their best to answer questions and guide people in the right direction. They have a symbiotic relationship with the greenhorn. They really enjoy helping. They're also well armed and uh, capable of holding their own in a fight. They can uh, take on some of the more hostile species. Very few will attack a programmatic as mentorious simply because the rest, in, rest of the programming community will rise as one and beat the attacker senseless. That said, their patience is not unlimited. They have no more liking for programmaticus, no Googleists, than the next guy. They're just more likely to wait for someone else to come along to clobber the offender. So if you are fortunate enough to encounter programmaticus mentorius, first of all, respect their time and experience. Keep in mind that they don't have to help you. Second, don't deprive them of their food source. Show appreciation. That's what they live for. And keep in mind that they're not your new best friend. They're there to guide you in professional development, not to have someone else to play Minecraft with on the weekends. Generally. <laughs> also, look for opportunities as you grow as a programmer to answer some of their questions, return the favor, give back to the community. Now, another species that really likes answering questions, but you don't want help from this one. Programmaticus take it over, I guess. This species uh, will attempt to take over your project from the other side of the country, other side of the world, without actually knowing anything about you or your project or your goals. I had an encounter with this species. I asked a question on a programming forum on how to show the clickable elements of my game on top of the video animation I had. I received the response, why would you want to put the controls on top of the video? That would just look confusing. I explained I was making a game. This individual proceeded to tell me that I was using the wrong platform, the wrong approach, the wrong language, the wrong process. I let him talk because uh, it's really not worth fighting with these guys. C 
See, the one thing the species wants is for you to adopt their personal approach. And they want you to do that without them actually thinking about what you actually need in your project. When you encounter a programmaticus take it over kiss, first of all, you need to ask the attacker to explain his approach. Now, that may sound totally counterintuitive, but you can actually learn from some of the things that the species may be saying. Even if the approach won't help you in your present project, it might help you with another project down the road. Ask further questions, subtly referring back to what your project needs are. And then, do some research. Consider whether, whether the approach is actually viable for your project. Either way, thank them for their time. Don't attack them. If they get hostile, let others handle them, because once again, don't feed the trolls. Just thank them for their time, explain if possible why the approach won't work for your project, and move on, ignoring all further protests and corrections from the individual. Now this species can seem scary enough in a dark alley, a dark message board somewhere. It's not nearly as scary as its cousin, Programmaticus Militaricus. Okay. See, there is such a thing in the programming world as good practice. This is a set of rules that we follow, generally style rules, that make your code easier to work with and easier to read. Now good practice you should follow for the most part, until you have a good reason to depart. The until is the operative word here. You will, at some point, need to take your own path, to leave good practice and find your own set of style rules for your project. Good practice is not set in stone. This species believes that good practice is martial law, and they're the martial. They will attack uh, as soon as they encounter the slightest hint of use or promotion of any approach that wasn't their idea. Now, I do have to say that scoring matches on topics of good practice are fairly common in the programming world. You find them about as often as you find uh, your coffee shop political debates. And these can get so heated that they were dubbed holy wars by the programming community back in the 1980s. These conversations are important because they help us keep our good practices on the cutting edge of technology. But again, they're not set in stone. This species attacks very similarly to a programmaticus to be flamers, tearing down their victim's intelligence and their professional status. But they're rather like a chihuahua. They will attack species much larger and more experienced than themselves. Survivors are usually left stunned and questioning their qualifications as programmers for obvious reasons. So when you encounter one of these, what you believe to be a programmatic militaricus, first of all, ask the attacker to detail an alternative approach. This is the difference between this species and its cousin, is that the take it over has, has a lot of ideas and they just want you to use them. This species doesn't have an alternative in mind, they just don't like the way you do it. If they can't provide an alternative, ignore everything they have to say. Seriously, you can learn nothing from the species. They will only bring you down. And once again, don't feed the trolls. Just leave them alone, back away slowly, and let someone with more experience handle them. Thankfully, not every species in this weird world of programming is actually dangerous. Meet Programmaticus Neuridicus. This species, uh, it's not actually dangerous, it's trying to be helpful or funny. Rarely succeeds at either. Mainly because they respond to the question without actually reading it first. I had a run-in with one of these. I uh, was asking how to do a particular task in a database language called SQLite. I detailed my question and I included all the details I could and I received back <coughs> the following response in its entirety, verbatim. <coughs> You use SQLite. <laughs> I was a little bit taken aback by this response, and I was trying not to say, really? I had no idea. I thought I was writing my language in pig Latin. Thank you for clearing that up. <laughs> but as usual, don't attack them. I left them alone. 
you have the opportunity to decide who you're going to be in this weird jungle of programming. First of all, never forget your beginnings. Remember what it's like to be a newbie, to be trying things out, to be experimenting and trying to learn all these weird words and concepts in programming. Because this is something that Programmaticus Newbie Flamers has long since forgotten. Respect boundaries. Other people's projects are other people's projects. Something that Programmaticus Take It Over Kiss has seemed to have forgotten. Hold your best practices with humility, unlike Programmaticus Militaricus. There are about a hundred good ways to do anything in programming. Be independent, take risks, try things out. Otherwise, you're going to become blobby and parasitic like Programmaticus No Google, so no one wants that. And look for opportunities to give back in whatever programming community you're in, whether it be online or in real life. That's how you become the best species of all, Programmaticus Mentorius. Now, all that's well and good, avoiding certain species, becoming the right one, but in the meantime, it's very easy to step foot in a trap. There's three of them I want to cover today. The first one is what I call the shiny object trap, also known as, ooh, new technology. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to step on a few toes here for a second and mention a rather hot button topic in the world of programming, HTML5. We're getting all excited about this, it's the brand new thing and everyone's wanting to build their website in it. And here's the catch. The makers of HTML5, an organization known as the W3 Consortium, actually said, don't use it yet. It's not done. There's still bugs. So you have to be careful about adopting stuff early. Experimentation is great. In fact, it's advised <coughs> so that you know this new language once it's ready to develop in it. But there are bugs and missing features in unfinished languages and unfinished platforms. These bugs are going to migrate to your project, have children, open the community center, a couple of churches, and then guess who gets blamed for it? You do. The user really doesn't care that the programming language wasn't done. All they know is it's your project, you picked the language, must be your fault. So how do you avoid this thing? Well, first of all, wait for stability in software before you try and write something in that language or for that platform. When it comes to hardware and technology, generally you should wait about one to two years. Now, I'm not talking about the iPhone 6, you know, that technology is already pretty standard. I'm talking about the brand new cutting edge stuff like the Google Glasses or the touchscreen laptops. Great innovation, but they still have bugs in them. So what if you have to develop for one of these platforms? Well, at that point, you need to wait on releasing your project until the language of the platform you're using is stable and it's done. If you absolutely have to release right now, at least warn your users, hey, it's not finished, it's still in alpha, there's going to be bugs. Raise your hand if you heard the phrase, I can make a quality, fast, or inexpensive pick two. Okay. We're not actually kidding about that phrase. Seriously, you got to pick two. Otherwise, you get stuck in the Bermuda Triangle of quality. See, if you attempt all three, your project ends up either over budget, <coughs> unwritten, or really overdue, or any combination thereof. And this is where we get the phrase vaporware. Um, the case of this showed up with the US military when they asked programmers to create the software they needed to run their new jet. This new software was estimated to have several million lines of code when it was done, but they didn't provide enough time, they didn't provide enough budget, and the programmers were silly enough to say, sure, we can do that. It ran over three times over budget, was never finished, and, um, well, it couldn't be finished because it had so many bugs in it, they couldn't put it on the planes. Once again, you will get blamed if your project gets trapped in this. Yeah, sure, the client asks you to create something fast, cheap, and quality, and, you know, do it yesterday, but you promised to do it. So if you find yourself stuck in this trap, first of all, you need to admit your mistake immediately, and then pick two. Yeah, you're going to have to tell your client, no, you can't hand them a world on a silver platter with a straw. You're going to have to scale back one of those three qualities. 
it is a sliding scale. So they say, well, I need it done this year. Okay, well, I'm going to need some more money for some additional team members, you know, so I can do that. The last track I want to discuss is called the confusion snare, also known as, eh, you know, I'll remember what this does later. We get into a flow, writing our code, or we're in the zone, writing cool stuff, and we forget little things like commenting, documenting, coming up with good names for our variables, bad style, please indent your code. <laughs> And you end up trapping yourself and other coders in the process. Because you go back to that code six months later and you're going, what does this do? And uh, that wastes valuable coding time because now you've got to put back your whole logic process and remember what it does. It also leaves you vulnerable to attack from some of the hostile mobs in this world. Because you can't defend your practice if you don't know what your practice was. I am totally guilty of this. I have done this. Anyone who has seen my code, and there's at least one person in this room who has, knows I am terrible at commenting, and I pay the price for it. I've uh, spent the last three weeks going back and re-commenting a bunch of code that I should have commented to begin with, so I'm wasting time having to fix this mistake. So don't be like me. Comment your code. <laughs> there's really no way out of this trap. So, just avoid it. Comment your code to show your intent and your logic. Pseudocoding, if you know what that term means, pseudocoding is not the same thing as commenting. Pseudocoding shows what the code should roughly look like. Commenting shows what you were thinking when you typed it. Write the documentation. You cannot RTD until you WTD. The documentation is going to be really handy with your big projects when you come back to them later. Write descriptive names for your variables. We can get into a nasty habit, I certainly am in it, of writing single letter variables. You know, like P and I and R and N and Z, and then you go back later and go, okay, what is Z and why is it being passed to R and why am I adding two before signing it to P and E, I, E, I, O, and I have no idea. Don't do that. <laughs> Come up with good names that describe what the variable does, that describes what the function does. It's called self-commenting code. Now it can be really easy to get absorbed into this jungle of programming and lose touch with the outside world. Raise your hands if you've ever used a piece of computer software and thought this is needlessly complicated. I'll see you, okay. Now raise your hands one more time if you call technical support for help and you receive something back that sounded strangely like Klingon. <laughs> okay, Klingon if you don't know what an alien language. This comes from a condition I like to call nerditis. It is an inflammation of one's technical abilities to the detriment of all else. Hostels are especially prone to this condition because they generally don't like newbies anyway. But Programmers in general are given this bad habit of looking down on non-technically inclined people. This is where we get phrases like the ID10 Tango error, ID10 10T idiot, or picnic problem and share not in computer. Even the Pimentorius is at risk of this because they want to help, they mean well, but they just can't say it in English. So how do you avoid getting this really annoying condition? First of all, use analogies when you explain things. There's a reason we call them windows and files and folders, and because they're analogies for real-world objects that we're familiar with. And it won't take very long before you start picking up on some analogies you can use when you're explaining to grandma how to send an email. Find non-technical activities, things to do away from the computer. Video games don't count here. Go outside, ride a bike, join a, join a workout club, you know, go hiking, go, just go play. It's, it's really important to get away from the computer screen, get away from this world of nerds, because it's really easy to get sucked into it. Remember your beginnings. I can't stress that enough. Remember what it's like when you first started out. And avoid inflated ego. It can be so easy to think we're super awesome because we can make a computer do what we want, but worth is not determined by our knowledge. Let me repeat that. Knowledge does not equal worth. 
You're a valuable human being whether you can program a computer or not. Now, there are some benefits to this. You can explain stuff to non-technical people. You can tell Grandma how to send that picture in, any, in an email without confusing her into oblivion. You can work with coworkers who have no idea what a compiler is. <coughs> you can communicate with users and clients who really don't know anything about computers. And you can design your software with your users in mind. We get into this habit of thinking, okay, I want to build this such that I see how many ways I can use a list box. Well, that's not going to help anybody. We got to think about what the user is going to need, and these tactics will help us do that. We've reached the end of our safari, and we've covered a lot of ground, so let me just take a moment to recap. There are a lot of strange personalities in the world of programming, and you have the opportunity to choose who you are going to become. There's also a lot of traps out there, so watch your habits as a programmer, because they will trip you up. Meanwhile, make sure you maintain a connection to the real world. Get away from the computer, unplug it, and just go enjoy this human experience we call life. The last thing I want to point out is that don't take yourself too seriously. This hit home for me a couple of years ago when I was working on my game uh, at my company. I came up with an idea. I thought, well, you know, we have this file that stores all the information about the players. And what happens if that somehow gets messed up? It would be nice if the user could just rebuild that file, and that way you don't lose your progress in the game. So I think, okay, well, I think I know how I can do this, but I have to test it out. I use a special program I wrote that can figure out how many combinations there are. And I set it up to show me what it would be like regenerating the first third of the file. Well, I start the process, and 20 minutes later, it's still running. I'm beginning to wonder how long this is going to take. So I pull on my trusted calculator and calculate to mathematical certainty it will be done. On June 26, 3598 at 8.42 a.m. <laughs> Come to a logical conclusion at this point. This is not a viable piece of software. Well, that's my, that's my safari, and I hope, thank you for joining me. Are there any questions I can ask? Yes? What is the name of the game that you The name of the game I'm designing is called Operation Spyrat. I'm working on it at my company, Mouse Paw Games. So I give you a card for you to leave. I've got a whole box of these things. It's nice to have. Yes? Do you like Minecraft? I love Minecraft. <laughs> it's one of my favorite pastimes, actually. <laughs> yeah? What are your feelings on front room representatives, people who intermediate between the hardcore programmers and the uh, general? You know, I haven't actually given it much thought before, but I guess it kind of ties into my general philosophy that I try and abide by at my company. Everyone working at a company should at least have some basic idea of what everyone else does. We get this disconnect when you have an animator that doesn't know how a compiler works, and a programmer who has no idea what goes into animating, and then you have a lot of clashes. Like, well, you should be able to do that. Why can't? Why not? So I like people to be cross-trained, so I think front row representatives should probably have some awareness of what goes into programming, the amount of work going on behind the scenes, and that's mainly to prevent them from promising the world in a silver platter to a potential client. <laughs> yes? What is the leadership class that you have to be developing for for the games that you're making, and what tools are you using to make Well, we've shuffled around a lot. I started programming with Visual Studio, which you know, some people like it, it's not my favorite. But I, um, oh, hold on just a second. Anyone? Can we give Jason a hand? Because we sure. have to leave her parents will kill me. Okay. Yay! 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 Uh, this is, um, I'm trying to remember which company that does this. I think I Project Spark. It's, it's, it's good to be able to, be, uh, to allow you to experiment with the platform. So, uh, thank you. Anyway, so to answer your question, I started out with um, Visual Studio back about five years ago, and I figured out pretty quickly that I wasn't a real fan of it. Some people like it, more power to them. But, 
I moved from there to Python, tried that out. Python's a great, great language, especially for um, you know, quick utilities, things like that. Um, and then where we're at right now is we're using a combination of C++ for the heavy duty code. And then we're also using um, Adobe Flash for the game animation and the interface mainly because at the moment there really isn't any tool I found that can quite do what Flash does in combining the GUI and the animations. But we're we're all looking. So are these uh, mobile games or online uh, browser based games? These are actually going to be based on the desktop. Okay. Um, we're targeting schools and one of the things I realized was that most schools don't have the capability to get high-speed internet, the latest equipment. Most schools still run on Windows XP computers or Mac power PCs, you know, there's a blast from the past. And they can't afford all of this fancy technology, so that makes internet-based games very much unuseful to them. So we're targeting uh, desktops. We're mainly going for backwards compatibility. You know, future versions of Windows are kind of actually secondary to being able to support the old stuff for that reason. Yeah. My question is um, something you didn't touch on, but okay. what's kind of a, I'd say, a pet peeve for a computer programmer against designers? What's that about? Like, what's something that you don't believe that designers get, and it makes it a lot harder for you guys? Right. Ironically, I'm going to approach that issue from the opposite side of it first. We don't get designers. <laughs> so the same things that irritate us about them are the same things that irritate them about us. I've seen it happen many times in which a programmer has absolutely no idea how much work goes into an animation. And so they asked for something yesterday. I think that's the same kind of thing that's going on with the developers. And, you know, what irritates us about developers is they don't really understand what goes into programming something. And so they are wondering why we can't just adapt our methods to their creative idea. Their idea is great, but it may be logically impossible on a computer, and they can't quite understand that because they haven't taken uh, computer science. At the same time, we may be wanting them to do something in animation that, frankly, they can't do in a reasonable amount of time, if at all, and because we haven't taken animation, we have no idea. So I think it just comes, to, I think it just ties in with um, Avoiding the nerditis and avoiding that thought process that we've got it down because ours is only one way of thinking and when we can understand other methods of thinking, it'll help us explain issues to non-technical people in a way that that will resolve that conflict. We can explain to a developer in their language why we can't do something on the computer. They won't have any need to get irritated with us because they'll understand. Thank you very much.